Are there any other like, <laughs> bizarre, crazy, out there applications that don't involve clean energy? Like, is there anything that's like outside the spectrum of energy that we could that this could be used for? Like, outside of like cars or or smokestacks or engines? I don't know. I would say probably, but I'm not going to put my neck out there on the chopping block and say yes, there is. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I'm still learning. What, so. What's like the wildest speculation that people are talking that Malcolm might be talking about? I think about? space propulsion. Space propulsion. Yeah, using this as a propulsion system, and there is a, there is yeah, there's one of the things that's uh, kind of on the drawing board now is a prototype jet engine that could be used both as a power plant in like submarines and in space, space propulsion. Like for rockets. Mm -hmm. Now you would think there would be a better way other than just blasting rockets into outer space. So you would think you wouldn't even need a rocket, right? You would think you could get something else that could just pull itself through the universe. Like some of the crazy anti-gravity technology that some of these guys are talking about with UFOs. Uh -huh. How these things bend, they fall through gravity by basically uh, creating some sort of anti-gravity. I don't know the physics of it. Well, there are, there are some concepts out there that are pretty esoteric as far as the plasma plasmoid uh, uh, applications. But I've deliberately not tried to dive into those yet only because I'm still, like I said, I'm, I got to get in at least high school, plasma high school before I do that. I'm still in grade school. Mm -hmm. So what is that? Can you show that slide that you were showing before that showed like the big mountain, like the diagram of the mountain with the rockets inside? Um, what does that say? Earth is what? Or, okay. So Earth diameter. You should recognize that number, right? Can you blow it up? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, seventy nine twenty. <laughs> I remember that number from yesterday. Are you kidding me? I'll never forget that number. <laughs> God, <that's, laughs> and thirty nine sixty is that's the radius. radius. So double thirty nine sixty is seventy nine twenty. Got it. Okay. Now this is showing a diagram of solar wind, the sun's diameter, which is eight sixty four, and radius of that number four three two, the radius of the sun, solar wind, solar wind leaving the sun. Okay. So essentially, like these machines could just use energy from the sun to operate and not have to use fossil fuels to start up? That could be what this is implying. Because they, see, the key is you have to get you have to get matter up to the requisite temperatures to disassociate the electrons and the neutrons. And I right. as I understand it, that was the function of the ionization chamber. Right, right. Was to it, it enabled the reduction to and that's what they're calling the Lear, low energy, uh, low energy. Uh, shit, I don't remember now. I'm getting tired. I guess. Yeah. Um, I better probably have another head off the here. <laughs> off the. Uh, no, we're on the final stretch, anyways. Let's wrap it up. Yeah, let's wrap it up. Ooh. <sighs> Woohoo! There you go, Randall. I'll, I'll send you some. Oh, okay. But yeah, I, this is. Oh yeah, go back to that one with the yeah, rockets. This is definitely what I'm. I'm going to be diving into this absolutely because this is where it really very fascinating to me. Um, but how it works, don't ask me to explain it yet. But you All can right. see a spacecraft launcher and payload delivery system, and that schematic, that exploded schematic that I showed you, is the idea of of building these engines using that are running on plasma energy. Mm -hmm. So that's further down the road, and I'm not ready to even attempt an explanation of that yet. Um, but you can well, see, well, it's fascinating. And thanks for showing these slides. These slides, the slides are, are wild. Yeah. This looks like rockets that are housed inside some big mountain, and yeah. I guess they get pushed through that plasma generator tube. Uh, I'm guessing that's what's going on there. Yeah. So yeah, there's a lot to this. Um, and this is my the first time I've ever done a, a a recorded public presentation diving into this much detail. Okay. On on this, uh, but it's good because, um, like I said, I I'm very much now a student of this, trying to understand it, and I think that there's multiple dimensions to this whole phenomena 
that many people will be exploring for years to come, and we'll be figuring out applications that we haven't even begun to imagine yet. Um, and I've seen enough now to become convinced that it's real. And the, the I mean, now there are dozens of people that I'm aware of that I've communicated with or I am aware of that have seen it and participated in the testing. Not, you know, not lightweight people who have a strong scientific background. So I think at this point it's, it's, it's past it, it, an important hurdle from the time I made those first comments on Joe Rogan. And that is these three levels of testing that have now been demonstrated. One, the, what I just showed you, the, the retrofit of the power plant in England, um, what happened at the Tesla tech conve- conference there, and what is now happening as we speak, which hopefully soon we'll we'll have be able to get you know reveal the specifics on that. It'll be interesting to see how this evolves and how it pans out, especially when it comes to like mainstream people in academia at, at universities starting to study this stuff and taking it seriously. And like you, we were talking about before we started the podcast, being published in journals mm-hmm. because you were even saying that some of the stuff, the evidence of the Younger Dryas and the Younger Dryas period with the cataclysms that happened there, contributing to the ch- drastic change in climate is mm-hmm. still being it's being kept out of the journals. Yeah. That's what it seems like. And this and what's interesting is that that first two thousand and seven paper that came out proposing a, a younger dryas impact was published, I believe it was at the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. A lot of the articles that have come out subsequent to that um, were published in the mainstream journals, and there's dozens of them. I mean, I have copies of all of them. I've read all of them. Um, you know, that's something I can actually talk about a, with a little bit more um, confidence, say, than I'm talking about plasma technology, because it's something I have been actually studying for years. Where these two dovetail is the is the idea that if you've got evidence of these ancient catastrophes that have remodeled the surface of the globe and potentially caused the collapse of civilization, um, then we have to kind of open our minds like we were talking about earlier. Number one, don't be looking in a mirror. Don't be necessarily thinking that an advanced civilization or a scientifically sophisticated civilization has to look like our own. Because if you're looking for a, a, a mirror image of our own, we could overlook it. The second thing is is realizing, and this is why I do the tours, why I'm trying to bring people into the field, and I've been bringing more and more geologists into the field to try to show them uh, here is the evidence and here is the, 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 the language of catastrophism, like we talked about with Ben. So when, when the... the, the um, the the interview with myself and Ben, when you post that, people will be able to listen to that, you know, where I'm discussing this this idea that, you know, there's a whole uh, there's a whole grammar of this that I'm trying to get people. It's a, it, it's literacy in being able to read this story that's writ large into the landscape of planet Earth that has literally but literally been waiting 13,000 years to reveal itself. And we're now at that stage where we can see that we can begin to begin to decipher and actually read this epic story that has been waiting eyes to see the ears to hear and the mind to comprehend and that's what i'm trying to do with these tours now this comes along and dovetails with that i think because and and we'll get more into we'll have more discussions on this i believe as we go further down the road um but you saw just a few tantalizing hints that perhaps some variation of this kind of technology was already had been discovered and utilized once upon a time. Right. Maybe even in prehistory. And what we're seeing in the legends and the stories of Indra and Zeus and the Vajra and the Vimanas and all of this kind of stuff that would seem to imply some kind of a technology. Maybe it's not just the conjurations of pre-literate, you know, out of control imaginations, but is actually fragments uh, of memories of something that actually once existed. And from from what I've learned up to this point, I would say I can come up with no more uh, potential candidate for what a technology would have been based upon than this, the, the utilization and the control of plasma energy. 
And when I learned that 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 the, the geometry and the frequency and the numbers that, that are measured by these frequencies are key to the operation of this technology, that seemed to confirm what I had instinctively realized through my own studies of sacred geometry, that it was more than just an aesthetic, that there was something probably scientific and technological at the base of sacred geometry. Why are ancient cultures using sacred geometry all over the world to build these structures? Right. Yeah, it's just, you know, so I think we may be on the cusp of something very interesting because on the one hand, application of this technology, like George Lush is that we watched the interview, he's just, you know, his imagination is, is, going crazy, thinking about potentially what could we do with this, right? Literally, the potential might be here to change the industrial landscape of the earth. I mean, it could be as profound as the shift into the internal combustion engine or the utilization of alternating current energy. Um, and if this is not suppressed, maybe a generation from now, the landscape of the earth is going to look very different. <laughs>